waiters or our guests. I think that's a great start. Uh, if you wish to receive our announcements of the upcoming events, if you could put your email on over there, uh, and you will start getting them. So, welcome, uh, Ainsley and Bella. Please join me in welcoming them on behalf of Russian Studies. Thank you, Yasha. Thank you, Bella. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm just going to say a couple things about our format and some of our context before we get going. Um, as you probably know, we're going to read from two books that we've worked on, both with Ugly Duckling Press. The first one came out in 2013, a collection of poems by Vsevolod Nikrasov. The second just came out, and it's a selection of diary entries and poems by Igor Kolin. <coughs> um, we're going to read from Nikrasov, and then we'll take a short break during which Matvey will talk about us, <laughs> apparently. Uh, and then we will, we will close with Kolin. Um, but before we get into the reading, uh, we wanted to just say a couple of things uh, to contextualize our poets and to explain why we did these two books, and so on. Um, and so for those of you who are extremely well informed about the poets are Lianozova, I apologize, I will be repeating things, but maybe for some of you this will be news. Um, so, to tell a long story short, Nikrasis and Napoleon were friends. Okay, they, um, they were not really close in age. Napoleon was uh, four, 14 years older than Nikrasis, but they met as relatively young men in the late 1950s in Moscow. And they just kind of had a friend group, and they hung out and read each other poems. Um, <coughs> so that's the basic connection between the two writers. Um, but where they hung out is worth noting. Um, so there was a kind of a suburb outside of Moscow in the in the early in the post-war period that was built up with temporary housing. It was basically we can think of it in American terms as kind of a trailer park. Um, and there were lots of these barracks type housing, that's what they were called, because it was like cheap, quick uh, housing, like what you would build for soldiers, all around the outskirts of the city. And this was partly because the city was expanding rapidly, and these were housing for the people who were building the expansion. But it was also because there were lots of people who wanted to be in Moscow but didn't have the right kind of registration, and so they had to live literally on the margins of the city. Um, so Holin ended up there in the mid-50s because of his colorful biography, which you can read about in the book. Um, <coughs> it was kind of a very indirect kind of path that took him to this one suburb called Lianozova. And he there made the acquaintance of a poet and artist called Yevgeny Krapivnitsky. And Yevgeny Krapivnitsky was born actually back in the 19th century. He was quite a lot older than these guys, and he was sort of the granddaddy of a group of unofficial writers and artists who gathered uh, at his barracks house. Um, actually, I think it was his son-in-law, Oscar Rabin's barracks house that they more often gathered at. Um, and they had Sunday salons with actual painting, d displaying their paintings. And the, the writers who were part of this group would read their work, including Kolin. And then as of 1959, Nikrasov, he showed up there in 1959. So <coughs> the barracks are a really important part of the kind of aesthetics that these painters and writers were working with. Because as some of you know, at this point in the Soviet Union, the official aesthetic policy was something called socialist realism, which was, again, to give you an American referent, basically enforced Norman Rockwell. <laughs> except except uh, you replace the patriots with happy Soviet workers, fields of sunflowers, um, um, uh, very clean and triumphant revolutionaries, uh, and, and that was basically what you had to write or paint in order to have a career in the Soviet system. So this is not, you know, there are some ways in which this can resonate with our experience today because of course any of anybody here who is a professional writer or artist knows that you usually have an easier time getting ahead if you have an ear to the ground in terms of what's popular in a given moment. Uh, but of course, in the Soviet context, 
this was a lot more uh, strict. And if you happened to do things the wrong way, you wouldn't just get a gallery, not get a gallery show or not get published, but you might find yourself in a labor camp, <coughs> which is actually, uh, just to take one example, what happened to Yevgeny Krapivnitsky's son, Lev, uh, and also what happened to Alexander Ginsberg, who was the, the uh, publisher, songwriter, and poet who took Nikrasov first to Lian Mozova. Um, meanwhile, so these guys who are painting and writing poetry in the barracks, they are painting and writing poetry about the barracks. Okay, so they are not painting happy sunflowers or triumphant workers. They are talking about squalor and poverty and alcoholism and really disgusting ways that people are with each other in verse and, and on the canvas. Um, <clears throat> so this basically is why we refer to these poets as unofficial poets. So both Kolin and Nikrasov uh, barely attempted to get any of their work into the press. They both knew that their uh, poetics were too much out of line with the official aesthetics to even try. Nikrasov had like a student publication in some obscure like high school newspaper and uh, both of them, Kolin more successfully, did publish children's books and children's poetry. Uh, but that was, and you'll hear that in, in what we read. Um, in fact, some of the poems from Nikrasov that we will read are poems that he <coughs> tried to push as children's poems very unsuccessfully. And we can talk more about that later um, if you want. Um, but to get back to just uh, kind of talking about the uh, shared aesthetics of Holin and Nikrasov and what brings them together, because as you'll hear, they're really different um, as poets. There is this um, strong urge in both of them to write about what's real. Okay, so this, uh, uh, Nikrasev uses the word concrete a lot. As you'll hear in Kholin, he kind of takes real in a grotesque direction, but this is a, a reaction against the happy sunflowers. Um, later on, in terms of the, where their careers went later, because they both continued writing um, uh, well after the Soviet period ended, um, Holin kind of extends this grotesque into outer space, into his own persona. You'll, you'll get to hear about this. Nikrasov basically just digs deeper and deeper into language. Um, and hopefully you'll hear some no. of that as well. No. No. <laughs> no. 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 And for me, no. Verses. Growth of the uttermost subsequent earliest advancement of measures according to the utmost earliest subsequent advancement of measures by the earliest subsequent uttermost advancement of measures on the subsequent earliest uttermost advancement of measures. Winter, summer. Winter, snow. Summer, no. <laughs> From Pushkin. Moon, 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 moon. You dumb broad, you. So where is it all? In Moscow. Where's Moscow? On the moon. And the moon? There is no moon. Moon, 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 moon. The way you hang. Who hangs like that? The way you hang. Is that a way to hang? But in the meanwhile, it's life. <clears throat> How's life? Well, you know how it goes. However it seems, it goes on, or it goes back and forth. Sometimes it's like life. Sometimes it's like, what kind of life is this? This is just vile. <laughs> A subtle matter. A house is burning. Like, it looks like there might be a house burning over there. Like, over there, a house is burning. And so, and what does this tell us? What it tells us, a good house burns well. <laughs> yes, gentlemen, yes, yes. Houses of bricks. Oh, gentlemen, gentlemen. 
Truth really is an abomination. Well, not really, but sometimes, yes. <laughs> you see, but you say, say no more, or they'll tell. I live. Better it be worse for me. It's not a public toilet, it's the people's toilet. <laughs> <laughs> You're a bastard for being the simple man. You probably won't get away with it. Wait a sec. In any case, if you're the simple man, then I am a man simpler than simple. Socialism or death? Why have one when you can have both? <laughs> <laughs> the police, with an initiative, wee -oo, wee -oo. one, two, three. One, one, stop. One, two, wee -oo, wee -oo. the police, with an initiative, police against crime. The fact that it's all just a dream, a dream from the past, a dream come true, a dream gone mad, a dream gone mad come true. Yes, no. then let's, let's just think like not that. Not think at all. <laughs> oh, what a jerk. A jerk like that living and people see him and know him Look at him. What jerks we have. Some even say that. There goes a jerk. A jerk like that living in our country. There's room. It's painfully gainful, dependably comfortable. So many perks when you're a jerk. <laughs> oh, it was so bad. 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 <laughs> there was talk of a man who looked like a prosecutor. But no talk of a prosecutor who looked like a man. <laughs> if there's nothing to speak of, there's nothing to say. <coughs> it happened. It happened. Had to happen. Had to happen. Happened, 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 happened. Whatever. <laughs> Oh, so many wonderful discoveries for us. Do you want to say anything else? I don't want to say anything else. And like you would help God. And me? What about me? I do what I can. See? I'm lighting a candle. Stocking socks, ties, fabrics, books, fire, shoes, clothes, furniture, hope, love. Wait a while. Maybe you can be alive. The cause of death was living. The immediate cause of death was living in Moscow. Yeah. <laughs> we'll live, we'll look, maybe even see. We'll be, we'll be. And if we won't be, we won't be. Let's give it a whirl. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. We'll die. We'll die. We won't die. We won't die. <clears throat> Russian. Russian doesn't mean and murderous. Means, and means murderous. We are arguing over this very question. <laughs> <clears throat> Poem about everything. This means this. None means none. Clear means clear. Exactly that means exactly that. If you need it, you need it. Have to means have to. What? <laughs> <laughs>
a poem about the calendar. And September ends in burr, and October ends in burr, and November burr, December burr, but January ends in airy, February ends in airy, but March ends in arch, April in ill, May in a, June in noon, July in August, and <laughs> August in September. <laughs> As an aside, I can say that that's one of the poems that Nikrasov tried to get published as a children's poem. Um, and they wouldn't do and it. And they wouldn't do it because, well, the, the report back he got from the, uh, uh, from the Dietsky Mir publishing house reviewer said that this poem exhibits a shockingly un, uh, uh, unrespectful attitude toward the ideals of October. <laughs> to suggest that October is just one month among the all the other months is absolutely heretical according to the uh, value system of the Soviet state. <laughs> it's probably not early anymore, right? And not even not early, but even in some way late? Fine, cold, windy maybe, but you can't see anything. It's dark. That's just it. It's dark. And on top of that, what? Good? What's good is good. What's bad is bad. This one is for all the Russian literature lovers in the audience. <laughs> Especially for Yasha. A canal. A street light. Here's the street light. There's the canal. Block was here. He stood and dunked the street light into the canal. The street light into the canal. The street light into the canal. Block dunked. Block dunked. Brodsky helped. <laughs> <laughs> While Nikrasov slept. Nikrasov slept. Nikrasov slept. Nikrasov slept. Nikrasov slept. <laughs> speech at night. It could be said. In other words, speech, speech as it is. What does it want? To Bolotov. To open. You opened the window, and there's the world. Someone. Who's that? And who is that windowsill? <laughs> the letter T. What's on the building? The letter T. And what's in the building? Television. It shows theater, a play, a turret tower. Who lives in the tower? Who lives in the tower? Who lives in the tower? Whoever lives in the tower, lives in the tower. That's life. <laughs> Apparently you can live, but how exactly might you be able to do that? And for whom? For me, as I am, or not only me, or not only just me, and not only think, think. Okay, okay, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. This is shit. <laughs> but really, whatever works for you. <laughs> Greenery. Totally. <laughs> this is a poem in four parts. A cloud. A cloud. Just a cloud, right? But still, what? Oh, a cloud. This came up. How things stand. How things stand. Clearly understood how things stand here. But properly speaking, things don't stand around here. Pines stand around us. Clouds stand around pines. As the pines go, so the clouds go. Here, but there, but that's both here and there. How things stand both here and there. Why are there clouds? Why? What's the deal? Why? Clouds? What's going on there? What's going on over there during the day? Why are the clouds going along like that, acting like that? As if, like, as if they were where people lived, instead of New York or Malachovka. <laughs> there, as though there were here. Cloud.
clouds, whatever you are, wherever you're from, from here, from where, it is lovely and dear to behold it like this, to face the weather head on, after which in the weather's wake, could this be the Lord God in profile? As though, but nevertheless the sky, how not to profit from sunset, midnight, sunrise, midday, sunset, could was, have been, could have, from there, so it seems, clouds. Clouds. But just where are they from? And under them here, underneath them, this wretched weather? What weather? And the weather, the weather, yes, wretched. <laughs> <coughs> didn't do anything, didn't do anything, didn't do anything, didn't finish anything. Climbed up a tree, then climbed down a tree. The soul. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's it for you. Now I might be able to introduce us. Oh, you want to interview us? Bella okay. Shayevich Ainsley Morse. <laughs> Thank you. Today on our show, no, um, uh, I was asked to say a few words, uh, Matvey Yunkadevich, I'm uh, one of the editors at Ugly Duckling Press. Um, uh, we worked together on the Nikasa book a few years ago, and then just recently uh, with my co-editor Rebecca Smith, uh, we worked with Ainsley and Bella on another book from this time period, or from in the midst of the Nikasa period, from 1966, the, the whole in diaries and poems, um, which just came out like last month, officially. Um, uh, I just wanted to say a few words so that they can have a little break before they start reading the whole one. Because <laughs> as you can see, it's, uh, it's, uh, acrobatic. it's a acrobatic and precise <laughs> kind of performance that uh, takes a lot out of you. Uh, so um, to give Bella and Ainsley a break, I wanted to, w did you mean Alexander Ginsburg Galic? Yeah, it's him. Galich introduced Nikrasov to yeah. Vyanozova? Yeah. That's so interesting to me because of the clouds poem. Oh, wow. The famous Galich song, Avlaka Plavut Vakan, which is the, a poem about right. um, the camps. Um, and the oh, yeah, we got to think about that. We might have changed the way uh, we read it. There it, isn't it, a. It, yeah. It, 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 Are you going to read uh, it all it's serious really now? Interest, no, it's just not interesting. Necessarily. No, <laughs> not necessarily. Really but it. I think that's an interesting, even yeah. if it has nothing to do with Gaidic, who was in that song particularly, but a lot of others were famous in the dissident, yeah. uh, in dissident circles. Um, uh, and like um, Nikasa's work and Horton's work were. Were re they were recorded and passed around in Samizdat on, you know, reel-to-reel um, -reel tapes, basically. So, an equivalent to right. Samizdat, there, the or to well. just Hubbard Nikrasov has a bunch of poems about clouds. Yes, no, And he also, and one of the artists in this wider circle of unofficial artists, Eric Bulatov, who Bella read one poem dedicated also to him, he, he's like this cloud painter. Yeah. I mean, he paints Lots a lot of, of clouds. <laughs> Um, but I, I, what I wanted to say about that was how curiously uh, unclear the political message is in Yukasov's work, while being clearly oppositional. But it's it's very different from Gaidich's aesthetic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. dissident aesthetic. I was supposed to say something about of that political but poetry, but um, but thinking about that um, uh, difference, to hearing you to read, and the way you perform this work. Um, Collectively, or as a as as a unit, almost uh, as a duo, um, that giving multivocality to something that was barely distributed, um, uh, performing something that was probably muttered at most by Nikasov and uh, and hardly available on the page for most readers um, outside of those inner small circles um, of Lyanozova and uh, nearby. Uh, people uh, thinking about how you uh, perform it. Uh, what comes so clearly f comes out so clearly for me is how this use of uh, sort of desperate or uh, um, frustrated cliche and um, parts of people's speech, fragments, found found language, 
eavesdropped kind of language um, or frustrated utterance that gets interrupted. All of that is and, and subtle and how that such a small movement or small uh, gesture could actually pose in some way this kind of threat um, to uh, Russian poetic language in a way that Gaidich did, did not in, in a sense. Uh, even though Gaidich did write about um, kind of the lower lower classes um, uh, in ways that probably other Soviet poets didn't, obviously, but, but not with the same breakdown. And it also reminds me of uh, some of the work in this uh, book we recently published of poets writing in the siege um, of Leningrad in the early, uh, early 40s, uh, which is also there on the table if you're interested, um, and that heritage to the Oberu, but that the breakdown of language from Yukasov is so is not a siege trauma, it's like visible in everyday life. Um, uh, so I, I just wanted to put that out there uh, and to say that uh, for you, those of you who are Hunter students, please tell us at the book table because we will give you a hole in book for 10 bucks. And uh, we also have a broadside of the Nikasov poem that Bella read at the very beginning, the No poem, uh, which we can also offer you. Uh, at a pay what you wish kind of price. And uh, we have a number of books there related to, uh, particularly if you're interested in Nikasov's um, uh, use of found language, I think the Rubinstein book might be of interest to you, uh, Collected Catalog of Comedic Novelties, um, which comes a little bit later than some of the Nikasov work, um, but has some, is yeah, certainly it's a, it's also aligned kind of aligned. in some way. Um, so please come to us, and Rebecca, my co-editor for EAPS, is here, so you can talk to her also about the series. Nick Fetzalita, uh, Emma Clayton from uh, UDP are here, so uh, feel free to ask us questions about what we're publishing and maybe uh, in, in relation that might be related to this. We also have a book of Agastevs that Judith Trubichina, who teaches here, translated. Um, so uh, I'm just very excited having, I've heard uh, Ainsley and Bella do the Nekrasov many times, although it, keep, cool, and yeah. I, and it keeps changing, <laughs> but I haven't heard what they do with Igor Holen, and I'm very <laughs> eager to, as I'm sure you all are. So. You're, you're eager, you're eager, you're eager to hear eager. That's right. <laughs> I, want to, I want to say, well, well, can we lounge a little longer? Right. Fireside chat. I just want to respond to a couple of things Matvey said because, um, um, no, no, they're great. No, I wanted to say two things that I should have said at the beginning. Um, one is about the you pointing to the to the obvious minimalism of these pieces, and I actually recently was just reading something um, about the even earlier unofficial poet Nikolai Glazkov, who is even less known. Well, kind of maybe as known as these guys. Uh, but he, he's, he's the person who actually the term Samizdat is attributed to. He w very early, I think as early as 1939, uh, was putting out his own zines, and he called it Sam Sibyaizdat, and that's where the Samizdat <coughs> got its name. Anyway, and he was also quite minimalist. Um, and uh, this, this article about him I was reading, the author um, said that he had explicitly said something to the effect of minimalism being a very important response to the overblown, extremely large-scale rhetoric of Soviet language. And so not only, you know, that, that it, it, it is expressive in many ways, and people in non-totalitarian situations have chosen minimalism, but that there is another kind of also subtle political angle to that choice for some of these poets. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say was about the reading style, uh, because we we just started reading it like this. This this we just came up with this, uh, and we felt a little weird about it at first because we had seen some video tube, videos on YouTube of Nikrasa reading in uh, just the last few years of his life, and it was mumbling. It was like pretty monotone, but then um, later we got to hear these really exciting tape cassette recordings of him reading in the 80s, and it's quite a lot more animated. And uh, um, yeah, sometimes it even sounds kind of like what we came up with on our own. And so that was very gratifying <laughs> for us. And we just decided to keep doing what we were doing. Do um, you want to say anything else? 
I don't want to say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I want to stand on this side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Holin? You don't know Holin. <sighs> I don't recommend him. He's such a bitch, and he's such a whore. His head's an empty bucket, his poems make you vomit. Instead of legs, there's crutches stuck up his butt. Got no skills, pays no bills, and yet he eats for five. How does this good earth keep that beast alive? Well, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Can't last forever. Um, so we mentioned briefly before about the barracks on the outskirts of Moscow. Um, and so Holin, who started writing a little earlier than Nikrasov, his first efforts um, in the 1950s were called, he called them barracks poems, Barachne Stichy. Um, and his first collection of poetry, which came out in Samizdat, obviously, uh, was called Jitili Baraka, the, the barracks dwellers. Um, and so we're going to give you one, we, we, we included a couple of the barracks poems in the book. Um, they're from the 50s, and we tried to have mostly 60s poems in the book. Uh, but we gave you a couple just, just to situate you, um, give you a sense of the trailer park. Someone tossed out burlap sacks. Someone splattered out their dregs. Ugly portrait on the fence and below in shock. Oh, leg. Two guys squabbling by the barn. One's already started roaring. Holiday in early May. In the barracks, life is boring. <laughs> so, um, also to situate you, this book, so it's <coughs> called Colin 66, and uh, it's just some selections from Colin's diary, which he kept, we, we think, for a lot more of his life. There's going to be a publication quite soon in Russian of a more extended diaries, but this was a, a selection that we found <coughs> in, a, in a journal called Zerkola, and it opens with Colin arranging to move out to a friend's shack in this village called Iksha, okay, outside of, outside of Moscow. So at that point, he had left the barracks and he was living in Moscow, but he wanted to get out of town, so he goes to Iksha. August 13th, lived through another one. Village life is exactly like it was a million years ago. It's amazing how well savagery and civilization get along. For the most part, people live in filth and poverty. There's tons of kids, they multiply like rabbits, some of the people here are rich, unbelievably stuck up. My next door neighbor is a drunken slob. He came by in the evening, mumbling incoherently. I tried but couldn't understand a thing. Thank God, he's leaving soon. This morning I went out to look for mushrooms in the, for, in the woods, didn't find any. I wrote a poem called, We Sowed Flower. The kids here don't play the same games as the kids in the city. The here, here it's all about arc agriculture. I was walking by and heard one girl say to another, go to the pigsty. My other neighbor is a drunk too. He delivers groceries to the kiosk on horseback. He drank so much he couldn't tell his hand from his foot. The horse had to take him home. A windowsill, some sweet decor, the flowers getting watered. Downstairs around the corner store, the boys are getting blotto. Meanwhile, the neighbors down two doors are beating up their daughter. An incredibly even day. Didn't do anything. Went to the movies. Some like it hot. America. Not bad. <laughs> Called up Kira Gurevich. Turned out Genrich was there. Or her husband. Talked to him. Called up Kim Meshkov. I wanted to ask him to move my stuff to Iksha. He's on vacation. Read Bloch's diaries. Not so hot. <laughs> Read Science and Technology. What a boring magazine. Didn't squeeze out a single thought all day, Monday. <clears throat> Days in the village are monotonous. Got up around nine, made myself millet for breakfast. I had it with margarine and sugar. The village store doesn't have potatoes, cabbage, or milk. Nothing. I went to Iksha, that is, I walked over from Ignatieva. I came back with six kilos of potatoes and a head of cabbage. I arranged to get my milk and eggs from some farmers in the village. Swam in the canal, wrote a poem. You may think this shining object is a washing machine. I am not what I seem. I'm a poet. The only man on Venus. My parents are loudspeakers. My buddies are light switches. My best friend is a blender. 
<laughs> August 17th. I remember that as a kid I was particularly sensitive to verbal insults. I think that poems should adhere to three <coughs> rules. They should be one, formally solid, two, emotional, three, intellectual. I came to these conclusions in part after reading a piece by Krishna Murti. Both my neighbors were utterly drunk. One of them dragged the other one home on a horse. They're both around 70. Holin broke his leg. Thank God. Nothing against him, but may he break his neck, may he break his back, may he son of a bitch, may he in the next life and this one, may his children be burned alive. May he fall down the toilet, may he choke on his own shit. <laughs> September 15th, contemplated the essence of existence. <laughs> we live. Bacteria live in us. We eat living things, livestock. Bacteria eat us. We're alive below them and above them. My stomach hurt all day. I kept sleeping. <clears throat> My stomach stopped hurting. In the morning I went to buy potatoes in Iksha. Met Tanya Libina on the bridge. She was on her way to my place. Where on earth did she get my address? From Sabgir, of course. <laughs> Holin has horns on his back. You want to see them? Stand back. I'm removing my britches. Hands off, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> we fried some potatoes, then we slept in separate rooms. She'd wanted to leave, but she ended up staying over. For some reason, things didn't work out too well with her, even though we started off in the same bed. Genrick didn't end up coming, even though he promised he would. Filthy and atrocious weather. Cold. A Martian couple. She's a milk jug. He's a hubcap. Not a bad chap. A poet. No privates. Instead, a smooth spot. They manage copulation through wild gesticulation. <laughs> <laughs> What can you do? We often have to do things that are obviously wrong. Here's one that's equally unpleasant for everyone. Combing your hair when it's tangled. But just try not to do it. <laughs> I should, uh, while, while you're admiring Baldy, um, we have the artist sitting here in the front row. Do you want to wave to everybody, Ripley? Thank you. Fine portraits of the uh, dramatis personae. <clears throat> this bottle of wine is for Holian. That's why it was made. This pile of shit is for Holian. That's why it was laid. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing more elegant than flowers. <laughs> <laughs> In order to live forever, you need to stop time. <clears throat> Whenever I reach the conclusion that the essence of existence is impossible to fully comprehend, I start seeing red. <laughs> Saber-toothed guests. Cholin is lard. <clears throat> Cholin is the wheel of a whetstone. Cholin is the elbow of a shirt. Cholin is the heart of a sheet of paper. Cholin is the gut of a trough. Cholin is the lip of a jackhammer. Cholin is the god of the tram. I understand Cholin. <laughs> <laughs> Women are mice in disguise. Men are cats in disguise. A poet is... <laughs> A poet who seeks perfection in others' work is worthless. No matter what you say about a person, it will always turn out true. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad when people say true things about you. They can say as many untrue things as they like. One guy says, I'm a genius. Sure, that's definitely true. Others say, I'm a hack. Yes, I agree with that. A third guy says, I killed a guy. Indeed, I nod. Everything people say about you is the truth, woven from nothing. A stick has two ends, but one of them may be significantly thicker. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to pour out of a container than to pour into it. 
<laughs> so in November, Kholin moves back to Moscow. <clears throat> and um, he's not real happy about it. The room I'm living in is dark. I assembled a bed out of a mattress, bought for two rubles. There's a one ruble table, two chairs for 50 kopecks each. Everything was so cheap because in Moscow there's a store at Preobrazhenko that sells confiscated goods. When Lyova Kubanov came over, he said that a person could go crazy in a room like this. Meanwhile, it's impossible to say what color the walls are. The paintings are revolting. The floor is filthy. The drapes haven't been dusted in centuries. There's dust and filth everywhere. My landlady, Yida Shevchuk, is slovenly and fond of hitting the bottle. She has people over every day, brings them all in to see me. I end up having to leave the house. I don't have anything to say to them and I don't feel like trying. They're all ordinary folk. For the most part, they moo instead of talking. Sheer horror. When can I get out of here? Not allowed on the subway, visibly plowed. Outside, the fog was a thickening cloud. He slumped on the sidewalk as if in a trance. While he was passed out, they made off with his pants. <laughs> it was an ordinary evening, which is probably why I got drunk. I was the drunkest person there, even drunker than Yulia and Nurova. For the first time ever, Yulia didn't pull any stunts, though she did get in a fight with her daughter. They riled each other up into some real hysterics. Yulia ran outside without a coat and lay down on a bench. I went out to talk her down. After that, I became so drunk I don't remember anything else. I woke up in the morning in my room and turned on the light. Here is what appeared before me. A pool of vomit next to the bed. A soup, my soup and lamp lying in it. My sheets were also covered in vomit. A cot against the far wall with Fastenko sleeping in it. My head was coming apart like a badly glued box. I felt like I was on a swing set. I got up and cleaned up the vomit. But even afterwards, there was a terrible stench in the room that lingered for a few more days. Fastenko woke up too. I woke up my landlady, Lydia Shevchuk. We all threw in for a fifth of vodka and six bottles of beer. Kwastenko and I went to the store. Safgir and Jan Sotinovsky came over. We drank everything we bought. I started feeling better. Yeah. Kwastenko told me that when we got home the night before, I didn't go to bed. Instead, we went to see this unbelievably sophisticated lady named Ayelita. <laughs> she didn't let us in. I tried to get him to go somewhere else, but he refused, and we went back to my place. Lita told me that I had to talk with her about our relationship. I told her that she's a good person, but that I wasn't going to sleep with her. Tolia Brusilovsky told me that I did a beautiful job setting up the cot for Kwastenko. I kept <coughs> falling on it, getting up, and then falling again, and then getting up again, etc. I have decided to sell the paintings I have. I'm alive! But it feels like I'm in saliva. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that! Orlin's face is melting as if hail were pelting it. His ear is sliding down his side, his cheekbone slides along his thigh, his thigh is flowing into a pail, and there's a hole in the pail. I'm sloshing, he cries, all over my galoshes. <laughs> I'm putting my last name on display. I'm ready to say it one million times. Holin, 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 holin's immortal, holin's immediate, holin number one poet in the universe. Thank you. Um, I should have said this before too, but I know this reading was billed as bilingual. Um, and I, I meant to say something at the beginning about that, but um, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of these poems are really hard to translate. <coughs> and uh, we made our selections based on the ones that we thought we could make really good English poems. And so it would be great at some point to have a, a poetry reading where you read like the ones that can't be translated in Russian and then the ones that, uh, that we actually did manage to translate. <coughs> So that, that, lies, that lies ahead in the future. But in the uh, bilingual future. In the bilingual future. Because I, you know, we, may not be necessary. Right. In some <laughs> ways, it's also like you, you, uh, it would be hard to have the perfect audience for that kind of a reading. <laughs> um, 
<coughs> there are definitely, like in this Nikrazov book, there are a number, there's a selection of visual poems that there's just really no point. I mean, there's like a literal translation appended to the image, but they basically are, they work in Russian. Um, and, the, and both of these poets have masses of other poems that are absolutely fantastic in Russian that we were like not able to tackle. Um, but I mean, we'd, we, we'd be happy to talk more about that if you have questions about the actual translation process, but that's why we, it's an English language reading. So. <coughs> I think we can have questions. Yeah. Colin had such fascinating biography. Uh -huh. I'm trying to translate memoirs about him. It's just unbelievable reading. Do you think it's true? Everything is, yeah. everything yeah. is true. <laughs> <laughs> there are stories. Lots of it sounds true. Lots yeah. of it sounds true? <laughs> yes. What's the best story? Well, about his personality, what he was doing. He was the waiter at the Metropole restaurant. Yeah. And he was doing many other things. At one point, uh, in Moscow, there were rumors that he worked in the camps, but as a supervisor. Mm -hmm. I've heard that rumor, yeah. Okay. And he has very interesting daughter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Alina. Yeah, yeah. She, she's uh, working for Snob. Mm -hmm. She's a and model. Writing, yeah. Uh -huh. She's writing quote unquote chick literature, but it's not really chick literature. She's just done chick. Barracks like chick literature? Yeah, barracks yeah. chick. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, uh, he also, starting in the 60s, had a, a surprisingly successful career, considering it was still the Soviet Union, as an antiques dealer. Oh, yeah. Uh, when he said, I'm going to sell all my paintings, I'm uh, wondering. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and of course, he was dealing hard currency, which was strictly forbidden. But you know, a waiter at the Metropole restaurant, what else he was doing? What else would you do? Um, uh, w there was one other thing I wanted to say about, but oh, I, I have also been trying to, uh, there, are, there are, apparently Kolin was really into mystifying his own biography. Yeah. Um, and so, and so there are a lot of really great stories and sometimes like some people say, oh yeah, that's absolutely true. And some people are like, nope, nope, that's, that didn't happen. And I mean, he has what his word. love like. How oh. successful <laughs> he was with a woman from provinces saying cocktail. And then his unsuccessful attempts to master foreign capital, like Olga Carlyle. You can imagine. <laughs> 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 There's actually his friend Yodkovsky in this book, uh, in another part of the diary. Yodkovsky uh, suggests that, that, that Holin is, is not as successful with women as he might like to be. <laughs> um, <laughs> I still don't understand how they started out in the same bed and ended up otherwise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so there's something in there about wrestling. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much for the amazing recitation, not just the translations. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the voices of the poets. Uh, so we have found language in both of them, and we also have uh, the Soviet totalitarian uh, cliches turned inside out. Um, do you think uh, that uh, there is a layer of language which could be uh, considered as entirely of their own, or are they more about juggling other kinds of well, diction and language? I mean, uh, Nukrasov has a very strong lyrical eye, but it's a, it's a general floating eye um, that uh, easily <coughs> attaches itself to the speaker. Um, I think that when you catch Nikrasov, especially in lyrical moments in his nature poetry, uh, you get an earnest, you get an earnest voice. But in a lot of the other poems, and is you know the same case with Holin, they take on uh, more of a comedic, facetious tone, just because um, that's the content and that's the orientation. I would say. Uh, oh, oh yeah, sorry, sorry. Just to follow up, just because I just thought about Rosina, what during your recitation of uh, Holin. I just thought that some of the themes which uh, would otherwise sound sincere for those who know the tradition are also ironic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think, from my reading of Nikrasov, I think he, I think he gets really more, more settled into his own eye as like mostly himself in 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 his later in his later work, and he's he's a little bit more uh playing with different voices I in the earlier stuff which is where you find the, m the greatest concentration of um 
Soviet cliches and stuff like that. But of course, I mean, once uh, once the Soviet Union ends, he is uh, no less critical of the new regime, um, and 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 likes very much to point out in poetry how little has changed. Uh, he is doing this more from a position of this is me and my opinion about it, as opposed to um, embodying the cliches. Um, <clears throat> Oh, there was something else I wanted to say about his voice, but I forgot. It's okay. We'll keep it. Um, you mentioned children's literature for as an interest for I think you said both of these poets, mm -hmm. and then I know Harms also wrote children's mm -hmm. literature, although apparently he himself despised children. Apparently. <laughs> can you can you what's the deal with that? Can you say anything about the attraction? It's like you should read Ainsley's dissertation. You can read my dissertation. Yes, I, um, I can I can try to, to summarize my dissertation in a, in a sentence. <laughs> um, uh, you're 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 absolutely right that. Um, Harms is a Daniel Harms is an important predecessor in both a lot of the poetics and, and Nikrasov writes about Harms. Uh, he's a big fan, um, uh, and also with the with the children's literature. And in fact, it's interesting because Nikrasov, up until late like Perestroika period, like the 80s and 90s, up until then, he like most people in the Soviet Union mostly knows Harms through the children's literature, because. The stuff that we think of harms today, there's a, there's some of it after the mid '60s circulating in Sami's Dad, but you don't get anything like a full sense of harms as a writer until the end of the Soviet Union. And so Nikrasov writes a lot about harms and how great he thinks harms is, but he's extrapolating from just these child, the few children's poems that were available because there was a republication of harms in '62 of the of the children's stuff. But um, it's really a lot of unofficial poets ended up working in children's literature just because, um, funnily enough, the, the censorship was not as uh, hardcore. And actually, in the thaw period, in the 50, late 50s and 60s, the children's literature publishing houses really made this huge effort to make their output more interesting, better, and like better for kids, because it was pretty bleak, uh, uh, as you might imagine, from, from the 30s on. And so they actually were looking for experimental poets because they thought that that was the kind of sounds and effects and formal formal features that would be the kids would respond to, um, and Nikrasov, I think, uh, really actually would have been a, he believed in it, and his poetry that he kind of thought would be good for kids, it wasn't at all hack work. Like he really, it's basically just like what we were reading. Some of those poems were in his children's book that got rejected. Holin is a little more like. He wrote some really bad poems about tractors for kids, you know, and like in, in, in the diary he talks about how, you know, I wrote a poem today, we sowed flour, you know, so he's like, okay, whatever you want, you want, you want happy sunflowers, you want tractors bouncing through the fields, I'll give you that because that's what you'll pay me for. And a lot of people basically were happy to do that and then, you know, it was, it was an ambiguous area. Well, we sowed flour is a little bit more absurdist than that, we should probably at Have some you point, said, track, track down, we sewed flour. <laughs> I couldn't find it. Actually, I looked for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, Holin's children's literature is really, his children's poems are interesting because they're all over the place. Like, some of them are really wacky. There's this really weird one about a thunderstorm. And then some of them are, are incredibly boring. Like, <laughs> so he couldn't, yeah, he was kind of undecided. He, Nikazu didn't write any bad children's. Uh, uh, he has one, ba the only book that he published for children, the only book that successfully got published is called Seven Vehicles. Um, <laughs> 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 it's not very good. <laughs> I think uh, Sabgir was a way more prolific. Sabgir, yeah. yeah. So and even Sokolovsky got that you book published. Yeah, Sokolovsky was pretty. So Sabgir, who you heard mentioned a few times in Holin's Diaries was uh, a, another Lianozova poet, Genrik Sapier. He sometimes calls him Sapier, sometimes Genrik. Um, and he was really successful as a children's writer. He, he, tons and tons of books came out during the Soviet period. How long does it usually take to determine that a poem is untranslatable? <laughs> <laughs> Some, well, it, de it depends. Sometimes a poem is immediately translatable. Um, and, other, and other times it's like we deadlock um, and can't and can't like 
can't agree on something that sounds good to us and that takes, you know, four to six rounds back and forth. Um, and that's, that's untranslatable if we can't agree. And then it's untranslatable if, uh, yeah, I think about four rounds and you can call it quits. And then, but there are, there, we have encountered poems where we say, just we look at it for one second and we say, yeah. no, we're not even going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that does happen. Yeah. Does it depend on the length? No. no. Some of them are two words. <coughs> no, it, it, no. It, I mean, it, it, it usually depends on what the poet is doing, right? I yeah. Mean, if the two words are nichevo and nichevo, then that's untranslatable. <laughs> untranslatable. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> um, tamtak. Yeah. We don't do tamtak. Yeah. <laughs> We can't tell you what it means. If it's not translated. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, we can do sorry. it in our ear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it can be translatable as a poem. That's right. We actually have a translation of uh, uh, a two-liner that I think is key with Nikrasov, Tavarish Vier, Tavarish Oh, I think we do have that in the book. No, no, we don't. And we talked about it, but we it's didn't. It's really a key text. It's really like the most clearest demonstration of his attitude toward working with the various layers of the language. So you, so you, I think there's a lot of examples of that. Even in this small selection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if this question is at all legitimate, but uh, when you look at different continents, uh, there are similar animals with similar functions, and when you take literatures, sometimes let's say Lermontov is com compared to Byron, you know, that's traditional. Uh, if you think about these poets, would you find anyone remotely uh, resemblant in the West in the Anglophone tradition? Um, you, are you going to say the B word? I don't want to say the B word. Um, <laughs> part of the, so part everybody of the, else is saying everybody, the everybody <laughs> says the B word about yeah, Poland. Yeah. Um, there's a certain famous male American 60s poet who was fond of drink. And also um, drinks <laughs> about vomit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think, I it's think that. It's a superficial that, similarity. I think that I think that there are uh, overlapping aesthetics with uh, Nekrasov and um, minimalist conceptualist poets also in the 60s. Um, recently, somebody who was trying to write about Holin and then about Nekrasov was trying to compare them to the New York School. So uh, roughly, their contemporaries in American poetry can be said to have some rough overlapping relationships with like. Um, academic poetry and poetic tradition and like counterculture, but it, the cultural context, the political context, the social context of these poets <coughs> is so different. The Soviet context is so specific. Um, it's kind of, uh, uh, those comparisons are, uh, I mean, in my view, uh, largely uh, superficial. I mean, depending on what you're using them for. Um, uh, for instance, uh, Nekrasov's minimalism um, and concrete poetry uh, probably overlaps the most and is, in fact, influenced by the concrete poetry um, from Germany um, Austria. and Austria of that time. Um, but at the same time, um, the way that he uses minimalism as political speech is uh, completely unique, and the way that he uses it to lampoon um, Sovietese, uh, the official language is uh, completely different. It has a completely different political context. And of course, like the aesthetic charge is, um, you know, very different when uh, he was alive, though very young, when people were being thrown into prison and killed on charges of formalism, which of course he could be convicted of. Um, so those kinds of comparisons, um, it, I, we generally kind of step away from them and uh well i think they just know they shouldn't be taken too far right yeah and i, I mean to give i thought of two more example well one more example with two uh illustrations which is that some some scholars of this period have pointed to again some pretty superficial level similarities between uh the beat poet movement and some of the some of the unofficial poets in the soviet union um <coughs> But there are, yeah, like, like Bella was saying, I mean, a, a brief list of some of the political differences are that, of course, the American counterculture is uh, explicitly leftist. And you don't have these poets who are, who are really not interested in writing about tractors 
they're not attracted to leftist ideals, right? Like politically, that is not what's going on. And I, I recently gave a talk about uh, Alexei Kwaistienka, who is mentioned in uh, dubious who circumstances, sleeps who sleeps on the cot. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> And, uh, and, and he is like this very bohemian figure. He, he's originally from Leningrad, but uh, kind of wandered around. And in some ways, he matches up even more perfectly with some kind of beat poet ideal. Um, but uh, he, one of his, one of his m he was also a songwriter and a musician. And he has this one very famous song called Liot Daj Diom I Yun. Um, and it has, I thought I would, I would illustrate this for you by singing you a, a verse from the song. I think it really gets rid of the kind of counterculture comparison because he says, как? А работать мы не хотим никак, на зарплату нам не купить коньяк, ну а вот купить мы с теты не хотим. But wait, but I actually have to do two because the second verse is the kicker. Uh, what did, how does it go? Um, uh, the, the, the something about вот бы кто нибудь нас пригласил с собой поесть, а у нас кто не работает так тот не есть. Right, and so it's like it's like we don't want to work. We want to like lounge around being bohemian hippie types. But we live in the country where he who does not work does not eat, right? Yeah, right. Um, no, it's eat. Yeah. I mean, it's it's yes. Yeah. Yeah. So <coughs> it's kind of it's kind of different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but would it be like a resistance to the main culture? Kind of, if in the West it was you know taking left ideals. But still, it's the mm -hmm. resistance to like capitalist uh, official culture. So it's still resistance to the kind of uh, mainstream. Absolutely, but with very different stakes. With like with very with very different stakes and very different um, form like forms of expression. And also, an important thing to note here is the difference even between poets like Holin, who really is pretty bohemian for most of his life in this way that we're talking about, and Nikrasov who, while he's unequivocally opposed to mainstream Soviet culture, his position is almost, his critique is much more subtle, and in some ways, he is critiquing the system from, from the inside. Like, he often, hey, if these idiots on top weren't screwing it up all the time, right? Like, he, he actually has the kind of values of a good Soviet citizen, but he is horrified by corruption and hypocrisy and all of these things. And so he, and he was not a drunk or a rabble rouser. His wife had a good job at MGU. Like, um, his position in society was marginal. He was marginalized, but he was not kind of, he, unlike Holin, never really embraced that marginality in the way that we would think of like hippies or, or counterculture types doing in the West. Yeah. You could also, uh, in terms of these comparisons, even though there's an obvious counterculture side to Holland's diary narratives. There's also uh, this difference with the beats or even with the New York School of influence mm -hmm. of where do the beats and, and to some extent the New York School come from out of French surrealism, Rimbaud, out of Whitman, out of uh, the Romantics, you know, in terms of their own stated um, mm -hmm. influences. And you don't see that at all in I think in Holland and Nikasov were coming very rootedly from a very, very much a very or Vladnikov tradition. Yeah, but Holin meets Krapivnitsky because he goes to the library and asks his wife, the librarian, for block. Oh yeah. For block. I mean, no, but I mean, and Krapivnitsky, yeah, yeah, Krapivnitsky yeah, starts off different. as a symbolist. I mean, yeah. Krapivnitsky's are. I think it's a little more mixed. I mean, I see what you're saying, but even Nikasov. I mean, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to see because the, they really have this amazing, very formally innovative poetics that nobody else is doing at that time, and their lineage is not the kind of standard modernist lineage that you see in some of the more conventional, unofficial poets. Um, I see. Sorry, I think the uh, um, poetics of Holin and uh, Sabiri in particular have uh, some of Leonardo's poems. They have more to do with, say, art power 
it's a, a, a sort of poetry of extremes being stripped down and powered. Whereas others like Aegi and there are others within the group who are more really influenced by surrealists. And there are yet more others, uh, I, you know, let's say, uh, you can talk about, uh, uh, what's his name? About Duif, right? There are more other poets with clear roots in constructivism. Mm -hmm. and there are mm -hmm. all, these, uh, all the figures who, and uh, say, yes, some say Daniel Satanovsky had something to mm -hmm. do with constructivism early mm -hmm. on. So there is clearly several sort of roots coming together, mm -hmm. but some people in the group um, take clearly from a burial. Some take, like, I.D. is most clearly influenced by French surrealism, and it's, it's mm -hmm. all over the place. Like, they're all, but uh, Holland in particular is very much in the uh, poetics of power. And one thing that makes it so hard to compare them to American poets is that uh, uh, the poetry very much built on this clear tension. There is very strong official speak language. And there is the unofficial Soviet uh, language of daily existence. And, and the language, say, of Russian, of Russian classical literature. And tensions between these is what really makes these poets, where you don't have it even if you take the beats, there is no such a clear distinction between official speak and underground language. It's sort of one language. Mm -hmm. Where let's say uh, the curse words would be put on, uh, the work with curse words would be put on trial, right? But it's clearly part of the language. Still, there is a bit of fight over that, but that's all about it. In Soviet layers, it's very strong. It's like there is a classic Russian literature and a Soviet speak, and they are, the same words mean such a contrasting things, and uh, they bringing contrast to that is what's happening, particularly in the Thanks. Can I ask? Um, so both books are the first English language book length publications, mm -hmm. right? But they came out came, came out what four years apart. Uh, Nikras mm -hmm. is thirteen, and Holland is mm -hmm. just very fresh. Do you feel any? And that's a question to my creators too. Uh, anything has changed over the course of so Nikras obviously is the size breaker, I guess, for mm -hmm. this type of poetics. But Holland, on the other hand, I hear has been reviewed to a much mm -hmm. greater acclaim in the Paris Reviewer. So do you think anything has shifted, has changed? Well, now we can use Nekrasov poetry <laughs> even more strongly as a political voice uh -huh. about yeah. the current political situation, so that's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, in that, <laughs> no, it's, yeah. you know, no, I mean, we should say, like, we, we did a bunch of readings in 2013, and the political, uh, the political poems in Nikrasov were speaking sort of like, oh yeah, Russia's sort of menacing, right? Then we read in 2014, and this stuff about like Ukraine is mentioned in here, and Russia being an imperialist monster, and suddenly it's like, whoa, you know, whoa, we we, we got to read that poem, and now we're reading it, and we found all these Trump poems. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> is that um, something the critics react to, or the audience, or yourselves? I mean, I th I'm still disappointed that there wasn't more of a critical reaction to Nikrasov, and I wonder if the book is it's kind of fat, maybe it's intimidating. I mean, the poems are very short. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I mean, I, I, you know, you can only like lick your finger and put it to the wind and wonder why it's blowing one way or another mm -hmm. um, in terms of reception. I think, um, I mean, the, the yeah. Holian is prose, yeah. right? This book is more prose. There's poems in the back of it, and I think that alone almost guarantees it. More of a more of an instant resonance. Yeah, and maybe Holin is a more familiar kind of voice um, than Nekrasovis, but I don't I, I, I don't know. Let me just jump in and ask you this: uh, Some uh, poets of the uh, miniature genre in Russia today, like German Lukomnik, for instance, post stuff on Facebook, and that's the perfect medium for this poetry to be taken by those readers who learn about it for the first time. But when you find certain poems without the knowledge of the theme, without being part of a certain generation in a thicker book, so maybe uh, as a way of uh, promotion, you know, better than I, Just maybe uh, your media can be used as well. <laughs> I, I have, I have uh, over the past several years, I have occasionally posted Nikrasov poems on Facebook and people do really like them. <laughs> oh, maybe we should do like the, you know how you can get a poem a day in your inbox? We could do all yeah. Nikrasov <laughs> <laughs> subscription. <laughs> As captions to Trump pictures. Oh, God. No, that is a... 
I don't think I don't think he would I don't think he would uh, do that. I think I think Mikasa probably would be on Facebook though if he um, if he was around. I'm not sure Holin would, but I think Nikrasa. Holin is like general. No, he was savvy. He was modern. Yeah. What's your next project? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Bella's writing a book. <laughs> what book? Um Sorry, I'm you don't. You don't have to talk. About it. I don't have to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can keep the audience in suspense. The, I mean, the next, the next, the next project in term in terms of translation is. Um, I mean, we talk about translating Alek Grigoryev, who it would be the hardest ever because he yeah. writes these basically rhyming couplets, and luckily, as with Nekrasov. There are maybe thousands of them, um, or hundreds. there's hundreds. hundreds. There's a vast bank to choose from, so we could go through a long selection process and find what is translatable and what isn't. But um, for me personally, like I, I'm, it's I'm very I'm very proud of these books, but I really want to find a, like a woman to <laughs> translate, yeah, because it's it's a little bit. Um, ex exhausting to um, pretend to be men like this. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've talked about the two talked of us to squeeze into these suits. Yeah, um, but but I don't think that would make it. We have. Have you considered reading and drag? Reading. Yeah, I said you are reading and drag. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I wore my button down shirt. We no, we have translated fashion. Kilts. We should shout out. We have <laughs> translated several um, female poets. Um, which you can find in various journals. We haven't done a book. One of yeah. them is Dina Gatila, um, who will be featured in next month's Wozduch. Uh, one of them is Lida Yusupova. Um, and yeah, we basically, we, we do want to, this period, which is the period that I work on in my other life as an academic, is, is desperately lacking in women. Um, because these guys were all like for the most part jobless and drunk and all the women were busy like diapering them um, and they didn't have time to devote to their poetic careers uh, so the situation is a lot better now uh, not a lot better but a little better and some of the women who don't have drunken husbands now are writing really interesting poetry um, <laughs> So we're we'll, we'll we'll be on it. Um, I I I will I will uh, do a brief moment of self promotion. <coughs> uh, hopefully, sometime later this year, there will be a novel out that I translated by a very interesting Abriu era writer, Andrei Gunov. It's called Beyond Tula, and it is a a, a, a gay production novel farce that was published in 1931. <laughs> it is subtitled A Soviet Pastoral. <laughs> um, so you can look for that. And I have a couple other also really way too large scale translation projects. Of, uh, one of them is very serious academic, Yuri Tinyanov. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and also the novels of Konstantin Vaginov, another Aburyu contemporary. That's that's some stuff. That Do you write in your book also? I am. I I, I have. Yeah. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> I, I I will. I, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to. Um, we can okay. just enjoy the view. Yeah, yeah let's, let's enjoy that. Thank that. you so much. <laughs>